joy in the city joy in your life joy in your family and joy everywhere in jesus name gck authority has announced the next level move from the land of honor and integrity comes two in one gck live in Ekiti State, Southwest Nigeria, the Global Crusade and Retreat, December 22 to 27, 2022. A new level of Impact Academy for youth, young adults, and professionals. Titled Recharge to Excel, December 27, 2022, at 0600 hours GMT. All broadcasts live on satellite, radio, television, and all our social media platforms with Jonathan White. Our guest music minister, GCK, the gospel to every creature. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for how far you have led us. We are grateful to you for the manifestation of your love. Thank you for your goodness upon our lives. We know that after such a conference like this, will not remain the same anymore in Jesus' name. Lord, you've been so good to us. You've abundantly blessed every one of us. You have opened our hearts, our ears, our eyes. We have seen more than we expected to see. And yet we know there is still more. And therefore, Lord, we are praying that even tonight again, you minister to the need of every one of us in Jesus' name. We are praying, O oh Lord, that none in this assembly will be lost. None of us will miss our way. We are just children of yesterday. We do not even know much of the past. We do not know much of the present. We know nothing concerning the future. And there are many people that have made, made a mess of their lives, even though they're intelligent people, educated people, intellectuals, but because they do not put their lives into your hand, for you to guide them, they think that they are Mr. Know-it-all. They think they are lecturer know-it-all. They know, they think they are professor know it all. And then they come into life, thinking that they've got everything made for them. Thinking that they can guide themselves, they can direct themselves, they can drive themselves, they can pilot themselves, they can try to, they can counsel themselves. Whatever they need, they can get out of the books, out of the libraries, out of their brain, out of their minds. And then they miss it all. They get nothing. Because without you, there is no light. It is your word that sheds light in our cross, in our pathway. And therefore, Lord, we pray there will be no person here tonight that feels so self-sufficient that he doesn't need you. But Lord, we'll show you from the way we pay attention, the way we read your word, the way we say, yes, Lord, we need your guidance. We'll show you that we need you indeed in Jesus' name. Guide us, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Instruct us in the way we ought to go. As we come to this important area of marriage, family, building a home, blissful home, a blissful home, Lord, we are asking you that your grace abundantly will come into our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you for the members of the choir. They are the song, and what they sang just represents our own desire. We are asking that you lead us. We are asking that you guide us. Because we do not know the way all alone by ourselves. Without your guidance, what are we going to do? We are in the crossroad of life. When it comes to marriage, we do not know who we are going to get married to, what choice we are going to make, and what is going to be the consequence of the choice we are making. Therefore, Lord, we are asking you, you will guide us in Jesus' name. I pray for these members of the choir that as they have ministered to us that you will minister to them in jesus name that it will not be the song of a moment but that lord every day of their lives you will remind them they cannot make the choice by themselves alone you will choose for them 
You will plan their marriage for them. You will guide them. As they are serving you in this age, oh Lord, I pray, marriage will not take them away from the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. For the rest of us that listen to that song, Lord, we are praying, you will choose for us. You will guide us. We will not be brother no it all. We will not be son no it all. You are the only one that knows the way. And you are going to guide and you are going to lead us. For those of us who are married already. And uh, maybe we didn't know you when we got married. Or maybe we knew you but we didn't really pay attention. And we, had already, we have already made the choice. We already got married. If there are problems in the home, I am asking tonight, heaven will come on earth. Lord, I pray every yoke of the devil, every attack of the enemy, everything militating against the families of the people here, you are going to destroy, you are going to remove in Jesus' name. We are going to start with you now at the point you have met us. And we are praying that everything in our lives, everything in our marriages, you will turn everything around in Jesus' name. Lord, speak to your children. Our ears are hearing you. Our hearts are open to you. Our will wants to follow your will. We pray none of us will miss the way. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we are approaching an important subject. And it's a subject that many people have spoken about. And it's a subject we believe that we need to talk about it tonight as we are going on in the conference. In fact, without speaking about a subject like this, we may discover that whatever else we have spoken about, if we miss the point on the subject of tonight, we might miss every other thing. That's why it's very important that uh, we pay attention and I am going to appeal to those who are not here now. Now, you know, normally in your, in your school, in your college, university, it's not the uh, responsibility of the professor to call the students and say, come in, attend classes. Why are you not there? And therefore, they come to the class. And if there is any student that is away from the class and uh, he goes maybe to the cafeteria, or he goes to the supermarket or he decides to go to the library or he decides to go to the town and just have what he calls a nice time the professor will come to the class and then he looks at uh, the students and he says where is so and so and all the other students they smile and uh, with that smile he knows that uh, so and so has gone on break he doesn't want to have uh, that lesson. Well, the professor might just cast a joke about him since he's not there and say, we'll meet on D-Day. And uh, then he goes on with his uh, lecture. You know, that's what they do in the class. It's not his responsibility to call the people that are not there saying, come in. But um, I am not a professor, I am preacher. And uh, because of that, I'm, going, I'm not going to do like the professors, therefore, excuse me, class, all those are students who are away now. You are in the hostel and you are in the cafeteria, you are somewhere you are talking. We are dealing with a subject that you cannot miss. This one is not an elective, this one is compulsory. Because uh, this is not uh, one you can avoid and say, well, if I don't get question number one, I can get number two. Uh, this one is compulsory. Therefore, please, wherever you are, please come so that on the D-Day, you will not say, had I known, I would have listened. I wonder why I'm calling people to come in. Those who are in, they want to go out. That's all right, I understand. Now, if uh, you are there, I want to tell you, you must be awake tonight. Because if you are not awake, you might be there, and then you will not hear what we're saying. And if you do not hear... I pray you are here. Because you see the time is coming when you will have to make a choice if you are not married yet. And I know that the majority of uh, people here are not married yet. I know I'm always correct, but just to prove myself, right? Can you raise up your hand if you have not married? I told you. God bless you. 
And so we are talking about something that relates to everybody tonight. We're talking about seeking and building a blissful home. You will have it. You know, if you can just take this one decision in your life in this Congress, and you say, I am going to have a happy family. I am going to have a blissful family. I'm going to have heaven on earth. I am not going to make a mistake. You will not make a mistake in Jesus' name. Now, already the members of the choir, they have given us uh, the uh, song, and I know they would like me to be the marketing uh, salesman for them, and I'm going to do that. All the songs they have sung during this Congress, everything is on cassette. And if you don't buy it before you go, uh, I pity you. You must get a copy for yourself. Choir, did I do it right? God bless you. And so make sure you get a copy. Now, you see they have given us a song tonight. You cannot do it alone by yourself. You cannot go all the way by yourself. You need for the Lord to come into your life and make the choice for you. And what they sang for us is actually a message from the Lord. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 23. O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Please hold on to that. Understand that as we're talking about marriage, you cannot choose for yourself. It is not in man to choose for himself, to direct himself, because he is blind when you talk about the future. Please come to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42. I'm reading to you from verse 16. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that have, they have not known. I will make darkness light before them. And crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them. And I will not forsake them. Amen? Amen. And then it says in verse 19. Who is blind? But my servant or deaf as my messenger that I said, who is blind as see that is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant. It says, even though we are the Lord's servants, even though we are the children of God, even though we have the grace of God in our lives, there are certain areas where we are blind. We just cannot see. Because we do not see beyond the physical. We do not see beyond the temporal. We do not see beyond the present. We cannot see into the future. And the God of yesterday, of today, and of eternity, the one that knows the inside and the outside, the one that knows the past and the present and the future, the one that knows every individual without having to pass through you through an x-ray or a test, the one that knows physically, spiritually, knows your history, knows your case history, knows everything, is the one that knows who will match your life. And it's very important that you get that understanding as we are approaching this subject of marriage. Now, you see many people who try to get into marriage, they try to get into marriage like uneducated people, like people who do not have any thinking at all. They allow only their feelings and emotions to direct them. And there is no doubt if it's only through your feeling, through your emotion, or through what you feel, what you can see, you are going to make a terrible, terrible mistake. But if you will depend upon the Lord, who has given us the promise already that he will direct us, I pray and I believe he's going to direct you in Jesus' name. Now, as we get into this, already I've shown you that we do not know how to guide ourselves. We do not know how to direct ourselves, but the Lord is able to direct us, and the Lord will direct us. But, if the Lord is going to direct us, is there any condition? Is there any kind of mode of mind that will put ourselves, and then the Lord will say, yes, that's what I expected. And because you are like that, I am going to direct you. I am going to lead you. Look at it in Psalm 25. Psalm 25, 
reading from verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. It's telling us that it's not everybody that he guides. It's not every Dick and Harry that he directs. It's not every church goer that he leads. He tells us the meek. Will, I, will he guide in judgment? That's what judgment there means. In decisions. You want to take a major decision in your life. You are meek. You accept before the Lord. I do not know the way. I do not know the right thing. I do not have the right choice. I do not have complete understanding. You are the one that will direct me. I submit in your hand. I give myself under the mighty hand of God, submissive absolutely to his revealed will in that state of meekness. The meek will he guide in judgment. And then the meek will he teach his way. It takes being meek. That means then... If I am a man, a woman of my own mind, what I want to do, that is what I will do. I do not want any teaching of marriage. I do not want any directives in marriage. I do not want anybody to tell me what to do, what not to do. I am intelligent enough. I am capable. I am skilled. This is not mine. After all, people in the world who chooses for them, they are able to choose for themselves. Why are they treating us like little, little babies who cannot decide for ourselves? You know, if I'm like that, the Lord will not guide me. The Lord will not choose for me because he requires the condition that I be meek and submissive and surrendered and yielded and broken if he's going to choose for me and therefore you need to understand as we're looking at this uh, message that you will say lord i know nothing if i'm compared with the god of heaven what do i know what choice can i make for myself you are the only one that can choose for me the lord will choose for you in psalm 37 psalm 37 verse 23 the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighted in his way. You see that there is a condition. If the Lord is going to guide you, if the Lord is going to guide me, I must, number one, be meek, submissive, yielded, broken, surrendered completely unto him, putting my neck under his yoke, the yoke of his teaching, the yoke of his doctrine. And now it says, the steps of a good man not the steps of every man, not the steps of a wicked man, not the steps of a rebellious man, not the steps of an unyielding man, not the steps of a man that will not bend, will not bow the knee unto the Almighty, not the steps of the one that says, I know it all, I make the choice myself, all I need to do is to have three girlfriends and then I pick the one that pleases me most, not the steps of the lady that says, well, I know how to choose for myself, I know the qualifications I want, the height, the educational level, the property, and the characteristic. Once I look at that, after all, I pass a lot of tests, I can give tests to all these men and then mark this and mark this and mark this and once they pass my test, anybody that gets 70%, that's distinction, I'll take him. You know, if you do like that, the Lord will not be able to will not be able to lead you. The steps of a good man, righteous man, the one that is made good by the grace of God. It says they are ordered by the Lord, and the Lord delighted in his way. I'm going to do something that's very, very important. Pay attention. Please write the word steps. Just write it normally. Are you through? Now, uh, they tell us in class, I think they told you too, there are consonants and vowels. How many vowels are there? Again? <laughs> one, some are not sure. There's only one vowel there. What's that vowel? Okay, change that vowel and change it to O. What does it mean? Now listen, I'm going to read this verse and I'm going to use it for the change of vowel. The stops of a good man are ordered by the Lord. You know, here you are, and you have been thinking, I'm going to get married to this person, I'm going to get married to this person, and then something happens that there is a stop. And the Lord says that thing cannot continue. And it almost shatters you, and it almost tears you to pieces. Why should this stop? I'm interested in him. 
and interested in her and we have talked together and it appears that we understand one another and it appears we are getting steady together and it appears in fact i felt i could not live within without him i felt i could not live without her all of a sudden something happened that didn't really matter at all and this whole plan is taught you cannot understand now as jesus told peter you will understand in future that the stops of a good man are ordered by the lord it is not just the steps that are ordered by the lord even the stops even the hindrances even the blockages even when the lord says no you cannot continue in that direction or he says wait i still have something to do in that lady i still have something to do in that man wait the stops of a good man are ordered by the lord therefore please understand in your life it is not only the motion that god directs it is not only the high accelerated speed that the lord directs he also controls the slow motion he also controls the high speed he also controls the milestones he also controls the resting places all along in our journey he controls the steps and the stops of a good man and therefore you understand all that you do is that you place your life in the hand of the lord and you say lord lead me direct me control me on this thing that concerns marriage i need your guiding hand because i cannot go all the way alone by myself and the lord will lead and guide you in jesus name now i'm going to give you three points number one preparation for christian marriage preparation for christian marriage of course we need to prepare we students we know what it means to prepare and when it comes to the area of marriage actually we need preparation what preparation do we make and uh, here is where you will allow the lord to speak because you know sometimes uh, our flesh speaks a lot and that's the way the human mind is and the human body that is the way it is that sometimes the body speaks to us speaks to us by its feeling speaks to us by its physical need speaks to us a lot and sometimes when the body speaks very very loud we cannot hear any other voice you know if i keep you here now there is a point i get to where your stomach wants you and says i am hungry and then i continue and then your stomach says i am hungry and then i continue then your stomach says did you hear i am hungry and then i continue and then your stomach says last warning bell i am hungry eventually if i continue you are going to stand up and you are going to find somewhere where you listen to the voice of your stomach and then you shut off the voice of the lord do you know that in marriage it happens like like that that the voice of god is coming but because your body is talking and your body is giving you the warning bell and it's ringing the bell so loud you do not have the mechanism to be able to shut up that voice and sound from the body and say i want to follow the will of the lord i pray that that mechanism if it is missing in your system the mechanism to be able to stop that valve to be able to stop the voice of the body and then you are not hearing the voice of god i pray that the appropriate right mechanism the lord will put in your system in jesus name we must make preparation now as i said point number one preparation for christian marriage let's go to genesis chapter 2 reading from verse 15 and the lord god took the man and put him in the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and the lord commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat uh, but of uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou mayest not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die 
And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and uh, brought them unto Adam to see what he will call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowls of the air and uh, to every beast of the field. And for Adam, there, but for Adam, there was not found help meet for him. Now I want you to understand. Now when you read the Bible, try to understand. Because you see, there are many people that just read this Bible, read this Bible, and they do not find real answers and solutions to the problems that they have. And it is because they are not paying attention. Now pay attention. Adam had finished a science course before wife came. Don't you see that he finished his zoology course here? And brought me here? Don't you see that he gave names to all those birds and all those animals and all the reptiles? Don't you see he had finished his science course here? He had finished his education here. And then the testing day came. And God said, Adam, what do you know? Let's test you. Now, he made uh, this animal to pass. What's that? Give him the name. And uh, give this other animal gave the name. This other one gave the name. He passed the test. No other test. Finish your education. Did you hear? Yeah. You know, there are people, they have not even passed unit one. And uh, they just got into school. And at the first week in school, they saw a lady carrying books and going to the library. And they said, brother, brother. Something said to me, that will be my wife. You have just entered. You are just in the first month. You have not done any test yet. You have not finished your education. Immediately, something is telling them that that one will be my wife. Finish your education. Did you hear? Adam finished. And then God said, now that you are finished, there is something we are going to do. I am going to give you a wife. In uh, verse 15, the Lord God chose the man and he put him in the garden of Eden. He had accommodation. Do you know there are people that are squatting? They squat on campus. They squat in the city. They squat in the district. And then all they have, they have one long sleeve shirt like the one I'm wearing now. And then they have a little Bible in their hand. And then they come to church. And then they hear a message on marriage. They say, Lord, give me a wife. My brother, where are you going to put her? Are you going to be squatting after you have got her? Get, you will get a job. You have finished your education. Then you have a job. Then you have accommodation. He put the man in the garden. And then to dress it and to keep it. He had a job. He had something he was doing. Gainful employment. And you are working with your brain. You are working with your hand. You are working in a company. You are working in an office. Or you are doing, you know, this is uh, the time of agriculture now. Or you are doing agriculture, whatever it is you are doing, to dress it and to keep it. Therefore, you have a job. And then it says, the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Now the Lord also gave him commandment. He had a continuing relationship with the Lord. If we are thinking about marriage, the preparation, there is a spiritual preparation, there is a physical preparation. Make sure that all those things are put in place in your life. Before now, the Lord will be saying, it is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, that verse is very important. And it tells us something very basic about marriage. I will make for him a help, meet, suitable, appropriate for him. Stop and consider that. The Lord said, I will. It is the prerogative of the Lord. The responsibility of the Lord. It is an assignment that God himself wants to carry out for your life. In your life. And so that you will be a happy man, a happy woman. I will make him and help meet for him. Therefore, leave it in the hands of God. This is what God himself wants to do. Can you do it better than him? I said, can you do it better than him? 
he can do it in the best way possible leave it in the hands of god and let him do it and then he says it will be an help not hindrance ask yourself as you are praying to know the will of god in marriage if i got married to somebody that is not the will of god how will it help me or will it be a hindrance unto me pull me down drag me down destroy my life make a mess of my life make sure when you are thinking about marriage you are thinking about not just to satisfy the desires of the body the feeling you have in the body it is so that that man that woman will be a help suitable appropriate for you now you know that it is not every person that will be appropriate for you god has so created us that there is no man he has created in such a way that two three women will be appropriate for and you will discover that when eventually you get married if you get married in the will of god it will be the provision of the lord that the lord himself is giving you that individual that is appropriate only for you you know some of these uh, mechanics and you those of you have done uh, who are doing uh, mechanical engineering uh, sometimes you try to fool those of us who are not in that field uh, somebody brings his uh, mercedes to you and he wants you to fix it up you do not have the appropriate spare parts and then you see well uh, in the class in the lab and uh, they told us what to do how to chip up that one file up that one how to adjust that one and then fix it into it and it will work and therefore you take a spare part belonging to Volkswagen and then you file something here cut something here and they weld something here and after all the wedding and the chipping and the filing and everything you put it in and it appears all right and then the man comes you cover it up you screw it and paint it and and they rub it and all that oil it and the fellow drives it away the problem is after about one week he discovers that that spare part is not appropriate and suitable for that mercedes and you know that uh, those who have been doing operation and uh, they do have at a transplant they discovered that that in, in medicine do you say that you put this one in that your transplant and then the system of that man after you have already got that thing away from the other individual and now you transplant it into this they see that the system rejects it because there is something that doesn't try, they do not really work together in marriage is like that it is the lord himself that knows what is suitable and what is appropriate and who will feed your life therefore you leave it in the hands of the lord why is the lord even trying to do that for us why is the lord wanting us to wait on him and get married by his choice and directives i want you to look at first corinthians chapter 7. first corinthians chapter 7 verse 2 nevertheless to avoid fornication let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband i'm sure you've read that before and i'm sure maybe you can even talk to another person about that and uh, what you usually say is to avoid fornication let everyone get married the question then is why are some people who are married why is it that sometimes they go out of the marriage and they go to commit immorality when they were making the choice they want to get married to this fellow to them that was the most beautiful person on earth they didn't really allow the lord and they were deceived by what they saw and eventually they got uh, married after getting married after a few weeks or a few months they just begin to discover some kinds of things that make them incompatible and therefore because they feel incompatible now their minds will not be in that marriage the mind of the man is not on that woman the mind of the woman is not on that man and he still wants to satisfy the need of his body especially now that he has gotten married and now he begins to look out because he didn't wait for the lord you know sometimes uh, if you look at what god gives us he gives you the first day and your thought this is beautiful when is the lord that gives you and then the second day you look at that same thing you i thought this thing was beautiful but i'm telling you that this is a marvel 
And then you look at that same thing, and maybe a year after, and you are saying, I'm just grateful to the Lord. It is the only thing that happened to me in my life. God gave me something. I couldn't have made a better choice in my life. That thing will be coming, will be getting better and better, purer and purer, more beautiful and more beautiful as the days go by. When it is the Lord that gives that person to you. But if it is not the Lord, and you are the one that just goes ahead, and you choose for yourself, after about a few weeks, a few months, the fellow might even look ugly to you. And you do not know how you are going to spend the rest of your life with this person that will attach an arm. But it says you will allow the Lord to choose for you. And when the Lord really chooses for you, then your life is with that other individual. And your life match together, your lives match together. And you are able to continue in the Lord with the Lord with him or with her. Of course, you know. That it means that you are going to allow the Lord to choose, and He's not going to choose an unbeliever. In uh, Second Corinthians chapter six, Second Corinthians chapter six, and reading from verse fourteen: Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship as righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion as light with darkness? What concord as Christ with Belial? What part as see the believer with an infidel? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Can you see there five words used to describe relationship? Number one, it talks of fellowship. What's fellowship? Sharing together, partnering together. And it says, what sharing, what partnership, what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? If you are righteous, then you know the Lord is not going to choose an unrighteous person for you. Then it says, what communion? Communion is still related with a fellowship, but it's getting deeper now, and it's getting intimate now. It's not talking about something that is not just of a passing moment, and it's talking of something that really continues. It says, what communion has light with darkness? And then it says, what concord is getting closer and closer, reaching an accord. A concord. Concord with a Christ with Belial. And then says, what part? It's already talking of this a partner, that's a partner. What part has a believer? He that believeth with an infidel. And then he finally says, what agreement? How can you sanction an agreement? How can you contract an agreement? Agreement in marriage with somebody that does not know the Lord, the temple of God with idols. And you see, he's telling us he has a believer on one side, he has the unbeliever on the other side. It says in verse 15, he that believeth on one side. He says on the other hand, an infidel. And he says there is uh, no compatibility between a believer and an unbeliever. And then he says, for the believer, he is righteous. For the believer, he is walking, dwelling in the light. For the believer, he is the one in whom Christ dwells. For the believer, he is the one that is the temple of God. I will walk in them, I will live in them. But then he says, for the unbeliever, he says, can you see here? That really there is uh, no way you can make both of them to be compatible. He that believeth not, he calls him the unrighteous one. And then he says he is living in darkness. In fact, he is an infidel. In fact, he also tells us that he is like Belial. And then eventually he says it's like an idol. And therefore you will see that when you try to marry, a believer and a non-believer, unbeliever, it's like you are bringing confusion, bringing light and darkness to be together, and it cannot be. It's like you are bringing the temple of God to be at the same time a place for idols, and that should not be. It is like you are bringing confusion between righteousness and unrighteousness. Therefore, you know that as a child of God, you will not marry an unbeliever. Now, after we have settled, we're going to marry believers. I believe you have settled that. I said you have settled that. You will marry a believer in Jesus' name. Now, how are we going to get that believer to marry? 
Are we going to allow our people to choose for us? You know that is sometimes uh, what happens. Immediately as you are getting now, you are in the college, you are in the university or polytechnic or college of medicine and uh, post-secondary institution. Your relatives and your parents might be calling you and they are saying now everything is all right. Now you will soon pass out. What are you thinking about marriage? Or it will be that your mother will call you and your mother will be telling you now watch it although you have gone to university and i didn't go to university but there is an area of life we parents we know more than you or you must rest in your own understanding and all these born again born again you are talking about that's all right but on this area of marriage you must listen to me and then they will bring their recommendation they will say so and so there are people came and they were asking when you were going to come back on holidays and therefore if they talk to you please uh, don't uh, disappoint us talk because they have seen us talk to them very gently at least how do you know that the water is not good if you don't test it uh, so and then they tell you that way and then you begin to think my mother will really feel disappointed if i don't go the way of my mother in uh, genesis chapter 21 genesis chapter 21 reading verse 21 and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of egypt that's where they always take a wife for you if you depend upon them if you while you are in school they are already searching in egypt they are already searching in the world they are already searching for the man of the world that pleases them because if your mother does not know the lord if your father does not know the lord guess who will please your father and your mother they will be the people of egypt the people of the world and that's where they will try to make the choice for you but that's the way of the world and the christian will not do like that you will not allow your parents without prayer without knowing the will of god without knowing the mind of god you will not allow them to make the choice for you you need to understand it is the lord and the lord alone that will make the choice for you in judges chapter 21 judges chapter 21 reading from verse 21 and see and behold if the daughters of shiloh come out to dance in dances then come ye out of the uh, of the vineyard and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of shiloh and go to the land of benjamin and it shall be if their fathers or their brethren come unto us to complain that we will say unto them be favorable unto them for our sakes because we reserve not to each man his wife in the war for ye did not give unto them at this time that ye should be guilty here is another method for the people of the world you know these uh, people of the world it doesn't matter what subject they study in fact they may study the most difficult subject in school maybe they have studied uh, computer science or they have studied political science or they have studied mathematics or whatever it is when it comes to the area of marriage they behave like people that know nothing and say hold and he didn't know this individual before whether the fellow has aids or hiv positive knows nothing just looks at the painted face painted finger and uh, the bob the uh, palmed air and uh, the musicians uh, begin to play and the uh, people get to the floor and they, yeah, then he goes to one lady and says uh, can i have your hand and then they come out and they are doing the dancing while they are doing the dancing are you married and the other fellow says how about you are you married answer my question first well not really how about you well not really do i dance well i think you learn the good steps what do you think as we are dancing together if we just dance to our house i we are married and the fellow said that's not a bad idea if you have the money to give me food and accommodation and everything that should be all right and before you know what is happening it goes more than that you understand now but before you know what is happening they're already married and then they are wondering why is there a problem in our marriage the reason is because they were not prepared 
They just met in the dancing hall, or they just met in a social club, or they just met because you know they were doing funeral ceremony, burial ceremony somewhere, and they just met that individual and they spoke together, and now they are joined together, they are married. Or it's like uh, you know maybe the graduation ceremony that this person just met that individual and they talk together. Final, they are married. That's not how to get married. You see, if you do like that, you are going to ruin your life, you are going to wreck your life. That's the reason we're showing you. Those who did it in Bible days, it's recorded for us, so that we'll be able to avoid the foolish mistakes that they made. Other people, they go through the vision and dream of a well-known prophet. Oh, they say, I know that for me, I am not too spiritual. Therefore, I am going to leave this important thing in the hand of a prophet. I am going to leave it in the hand of a mature person that knows how to get revelation. Therefore, I am not responsible. I am going to leave it in their hands. You see, there are people that think like that. And they say, I don't have the gift of revelation. I don't have the gift of knowing whether this is right or that is not right. But there are people that know about it. They will make the choice for me. And therefore, you find on campuses, the people that will tell us they have the gifts of the Spirit and they have the revelation and people go to them for counseling and people go to them to make choices for them and you ruin your life if somebody is the one sitting in one corner saying i see this i see that in first samuel chapter 16 reading from verse 6 and it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eli eliab and said surely the lord's anointed is before him but the lord said unto samuel look not on his countenance on the height of his stature because i have refused him for the lord seeth not as man seeth for man looketh on the outward appearance but the lord looketh on the heart you see if you depend upon a samuel upon a seer upon a visioner upon a dreamer upon another person that that person is the one that will see the vision for you is the one that will decide for you you're going to ruin your life and you make in if you make a mistake in marriage is the most costly mistake you can ever make in your life that will be a very serious thing therefore you are not going to allow anything like that at all in your life now if uh, we're going to marry a right how are we going to make the choice is the lord that will choose for you i said the lord will choose for you yeah. you know uh, when i preach in the evening like this i like you to say amen very well you know why while you're preaching in the night and you know you have had all these good good ministers and messages during the day by the time i come on in the evening you're likely to be sleeping and so when you say amen the fellow does him by that side will wake up and say what has he, have they started praying uh, so when you say amen like that you'll help me wake up the people that are sleeping in jesus name <laughs> did i tell you this story before I'll, I'll tell you you know if i don't tell you again some of those who have had this before and they are forgetting they will not remember and those who are coming here for the first time when you go back you'll be able to tell some stories you'll say well if i didn't hear anything i had a story let me tell you so you will know i've gone to deeper life campus <laughs> you know meeting uh, this preacher was preaching and as he was preaching he saw that uh, you know there are people dozing and he didn't like it you know when you're teaching and preaching and you're saying everything in your heart you like uh, people to pay attention so the fellow he was still talking and the more he talked the more the, the more the fellow was uh, dozing and uh, you know almost falling down and he said what will i do now he said all right i know what to do then he stopped his message and uh, he spoke very very low and said if you want to go to hell stand up and uh, because you know the fellow was sleeping <laughs> there is the lord <laughs> he didn't hear he didn't hear the first part of the sentence all he heard was stand up and uh, so the fellow stood up and he saw everybody else uh, you know they were all sitting down and he said well I don't know why I am standing up, but I see that my, the preacher and myself are the only two people standing up. And then, uh, then he sat down. Later, they told him, and he knew it was uh, the pastor's method. I made it to laugh so that you can wake up. Praise the Lord. 
now if we're going to make the right choice how are we going to make the right choice if the lord is going to choose for us how are we going to get it from the lord let us now see in proverbs chapter 18 proverbs chapter 18 reading from verse 22 whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing you will have a good thing and obtain a favor of the Lord. You see, when you find a good wife, it's not something that just happened accidentally. It is a favor that you get from the Lord. You are a Christian. You are a child of God. You are a meek and submissive person. You are asking the Lord, Oh Lord, you are the one that will choose for me. And as you depend upon the Lord, and you are praying to the Lord, then he gives you this good thing. The good wife, the good husband. In chapter 19, verse 14. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. And uh, the Lord knows all his children on earth, and it is not difficult for him to choose someone for you. And I've already read to you that the Lord, he can never make a mistake. I said he can never make a mistake. And even though the wind may blow and circumstances may appear contrary, if you will depend upon the Lord, the Lord will make the choice for every one of you. In Proverbs chapter 19 verse 21, it says, There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when you have discovered the will of God and you declare this is the will of God, it is possible that hell may blow fire and whatever it is against that plan. Just get steady. Just get remain with the Lord. Because although there are many devices in the hearts of men and they may want to destabilize that thing, cancel that thing, destroy that thing, nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. If really it is of the Lord, that thing will stand. Nobody will be able to destroy it. All you need to do is to rest in the Lord and to keep on believing in the Lord. Why do we ask the Lord to choose for us? I read to you originally following the song of the uh, members of the choir. We do not know the way by ourselves. But God knows everything. That is why we who are ignorant, we allow the omniscient God, all knowledgeable God, to make the choice for us. Because in um, Isaiah chapter 46, reading from verse, um, verse 9, the latter part of verse 9 to verse 10, latter part of verse 9, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done seen, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. It says, I declare the end from the beginning, my brothers and sisters. This is serious and solemn. Do you know that there are some things you might have appreciated about five years ago, but right now, after five years, you don't have any interest in them. Why were you interested in those things five years ago? In your young life at that time, that thing just interested you. You wanted that thing. You desired that thing. You felt you couldn't live with that thing. But in the passage of time, you began to discover what you didn't know before concerning that thing. And because you are now having new information, fresh information that you didn't have before you lost interest just within five years that thing uh, is not part of your life anymore you don't want that thing anymore you don't you, you are, if somebody even wants to give you now say no 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 that thing will destroy my life because you add information which you didn't have originally that's the same thing concerning marriage sometimes it may look that somebody has a pleasing appearance you see that person for the first time but because you don't know what's in their heart do you know that uh, when you look at a person what do you see you see less than one percent of who they are whether it's a man or a woman you see a man that you are seeing for the first time you see his facial appearance you see his hair cut you see the shoes he's wearing what's that just about less than one percent of the real man his thoughts you can't see his mind you can't see and the wickedness you can't see 
Selfish ambition, you can see. Terrible life, you can see. All you see is less than one percent. And do you know there are people that would like to make a choice of who they are going to marry by seeing less than one percent of the person? And in fact, I'm telling you that even if you are living with a person and you say, well, we've been girlfriend, we've been boyfriend, you won't see more than one percent. What do you see? You see nothing. Because you see, people have been trained that when you are the opposite says, there is a way to behave. And there's a way to put on a kind of character. And there is a way to, you know, comport yourself. The ethics of life, of society. There are things that a person will say, the way he will talk, the way he will hold another person, and the way he will smile, and the cast joke. Everything in society is very tailored to please the other fellow. But all that is just something you put on. It's the wax. It's the shell. It's the outward thing. You just say, uh, you know, smear upon the life of the person. It is when you really get home, you really see the truth and the reality and the facts about the man, about the woman. But God alone. He sees the inside. He sees the life. He sees everything concerning that individual. He declares the end from the beginning. That's why we trust him. We rest in him that he is the one that will make the choice. He will make the choice for you. How is he going to make the choice? One, you will totally surrender into his son. You will say, Lord, I do not know the way. I do not know the person. I do not know where the person is. The people I see, they are nice people, they are good people, but I do not know the future. I do not know whether we are compatible. I do not know whether uh, they will be all right for my life or not. You are the only one that knows. There is total, absolute surrender and yieldedness unto the Lord. Then there is faith and trust in the Lord. You have confidence in the Lord that the Lord will not make a mistake. Will he make a mistake? Will he make a mistake? He will not make a mistake. You have absolute trust, absolute confidence in the Lord that the Lord will not make a mistake. And then you tell the Lord, Oh Lord, whoever is going to be a believer, whoever is going to be a person that stands on the word of God, whoever is going to be somebody that knows what the Bible says concerning marriage, whoever is not going to be a divorcee, whoever is not going to be a polygamist, whoever, according to your word, according to your will, you reveal to me, you give to me, I'm going to accept that you know better than I know. You are thinking about me. I have faith and confidence and trust in you that you cannot make a mistake. It may not look all right to me now, but I will appreciate that thing later because I will discover the reason why you have given me that individual. And then you are going to pray. You are going to pray. In um, Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah chapter 29. Reading from verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil. To give you an expected end. The Lord says, you think you are the only one thinking about marriage? The Lord says, he's thinking about you. He thought about Adam. He thought about other people too. And therefore, he is thinking about you. And he says, he will give you the expected end. Have faith in that. Have confidence in that. Believe that. And then hold on to that. You know it will never disappoint you. Then you say, am I going to actually get it eventually? In verse 12, then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. It says, you will pray. It said that in verse 12. Ye shall go, go and pray unto me. You know there are people that will say, well, if God is thinking about it, why do I have to pray? The Lord said, although he is thinking about it, it will not fall on you like a ripened purple from the tree. That you are still going to pray to show that you are trusting the Lord, to show that you have expectation from the Lord, ye shall go. You see what he has said in verse 11? He said, to give you an expected end. And yet he said, although I have the mind to give it to you, it is not automatic. You will call upon me. You will pray unto me. And I will hearken unto you. And you will seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. That means, although the Lord is going to do it, we will have to really pray. Then in uh, chapter 33, verse 3. 
Call unto me, and I will answer thee. Will he answer you? Call unto me, I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Of course, you don't know the brother you are going to get married to. You don't know the sister you are going to get married to. But the Lord says, I know, even before you were born, even before you became a Christian, even when you were still in primary school, because there is nothing new now that God is just knowing that you didn't know before. He knew the end from the beginning. And he knew from all eternity that this is what will be. And then he says, but you don't know. Here you are in the world, and you are in the midst of a large, large crowd, but I know you as an individual, and I know the one that will feed your life, and it's already in my plan, it's already in my book, why don't you come to me, and then I will look at the book and tell you, this is the person. Come unto me therefore, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. Now, if the Lord uh, gives uh, you a wife or gives you a husband, how do you know? Here is where many, many people, not only students, not only young people, many, many people, they make mistakes. They do not understand that God speaks all languages. They do not understand that God is not limited to one language. In this, our beloved country, there are more than 400 languages. And God knows every one of those languages. And he knows the people living in those language areas. And when he wants to talk to a Yoruba person, he will not talk Igbo to that person. When he wants to talk to an Hausa person, he will not speak an epic to that Hausa person. He speaks in the language that everyone can understand. Do you understand? And when God speaks to you, you don't need an interpreter because he speaks your language. He knows your language. And he talks to you in the language you can understand. Now, I gave you that as an illustration. Let me now explain. Some people, when they talk about marriage, the only language they think God can speak is the language of dream. And uh, you go to typical wedding, deeper life wedding, first square wedding, assemblies of God wedding, Pentecostal church of God wedding, any kind of wedding. And then you get the people there, they are doing the wedding, then they are having the reception. Then the time comes that you are, the reason why you are there, because you are not married, you are saying, when are they going to share their testimony? All that they are doing, drinking coke and drinking fanta, you say, that's not my problem. If I want to drink fanta, I know where they are selling it. But when are they going to give their testimony? You are looking for the clue. You are looking for the key. You are looking for how did he know? And then this fellow will come out and say, praise the Lord. Isn't this a beautiful day? Isn't this a wonderful day? I didn't know this day will ever come. In fact, I've been thinking about this day. And I'm the happiest man on earth now because of the queen that the Lord has given me. And if you ask me how I got this queen, I will tell you. Because, you know, it was in a night vision. I was asleep like this. And when I was sleeping, all of a sudden, I found myself in the room in which we are now. And I found myself holding the hand of this lady. And she will, he will look at the face of the lady and say, you are the most beautiful thing on earth. And I'm telling you, when I woke up from that sleep, I said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord three times. I have got what I'm looking for. And then you go out of that place. And you are thinking that, yes, I'm waiting for a dream. I'm waiting for a dream. And then eventually, you sleep at night. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Who doesn't dream? Yeah. Maybe even the dogs dream. Who knows? Who doesn't dream? Everybody dreams. But you know, I want to tell you something very important. God may not be speaking to you through dreams. He may speak to other people through dreams. When somebody comes to me and says, eh, Pastor, Pastor, I have a dream. And praise the Lord. I've got it now. I will say, wait. I want you, you know, if you're a counselor, if you're a teacher, you need to know how to open the intelligence and the understanding of people. I say, wait, tell me something. Before you tell me this new dream about the person you feel you are going to get married to, tell me another time in your life when you had a dream. 
And then this fellow will tell me and say, well, I can't remember too many dreams, but I can remember one. We were preparing for something in our sport when I was in the primary school. And I was dreaming about it that I was going to be chosen among the people that were going to uh, run the relay race. And uh, then we came together and I discovered that they chose everybody and they let me out. I said, that's all right. You know, it's, that's important. I said, now tell me another dream. And then he says that, well, I remember when I was going to take my jump exam. And I've been thinking about the jump exam. And then eventually, I had a dream. And I saw that uh, the names already on the board. And I went over there and I read all the names. And my name was written in capital letters. And they ticked it and they said, I was in. And then a few weeks later, the list actually came out, and I went there, I looked, I didn't see my name there. You know, that tells me something. You know what that tells me? That this particular individual is a child of God, is a brother, is a wonderful, fantastic person, but the Lord does not speak to him through dreams. Because from what he has shared with me, from what he has told me now, it is the opposite of what he dreamt about that always comes true. And now he tells me, and he says, I've got another dream now. I say, tell me. And uh, he says, it's Sister Grace. And I said, in mathematics, well, we know that the first one is the opposite that happened. Second one is the opposite that happened. The third dream, it was the opposite that happened. Now you are telling me, Sister Grace, if I put all that together, the conclusion is, it is the opposite. You know, you need to really understand. And you need to examine yourself. God may not be using dreams in your life. He may not be speaking to you through dreams. Therefore, you will know that it is not everybody that will be Joseph the dreamer. All we know is, whichever way God is going to speak to you, he will make it clear how and who you are going to get married to. There will be no confusion. I said there will be no confusion. And the Lord will show you the person and you will know. There will be a conviction, unshakable conviction within you. You will just know that you know that you know. And there will be no confusion about it. You will be able to say, I know. Like I know I am a man. Like I know I am a woman. I know that that is the person God has chosen for me. You may not be able to explain too much. You may not be able to give all the details. There will be that standing conviction, unshakable conviction within you. That the Lord himself has led you. It may be through dream. It may it may be through vision, it may be just having a kind of deep love, not infatuation, for that individual that is so shakeable. And whatever may be happening, you just know that this is the person. And I pray that the Lord will lead you in Jesus' name. Now you will see I've spent much time on knowing the will of God. I did that deliberately because the majority of us here, we have not married. If you have 100 people and you have 95 that are not married and 5 that are married, if you are going to give the message, you cannot divide your time 50-50. You have to divide the time ratio 19 to, 19 to 1. That is 95, 5, 19 to 1. You understand? And so that's why I've done that. Now you who are not married, excuse me, don't sleep though, uh, listen, because now I'm going to talk to your senior brothers and your senior sisters. Those who are married. I go now to point number two. I'm talking on the principles for Christian families. The principles for Christian families. And I come to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, reading from verse 24. Genesis 2. Verse 24, therefore shall a man, not a boy, therefore shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, not prostitute, not girlfriend, shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So when we get married eventually, then we're going to remain with the wife and we're going to remain with the husband and we leave father, we leave mother, which gives me the understanding that you already have accommodation. You are not managing in an apartment, a room with your father, with your mother. You are able to rent an apartment for yourself and then you live together with that wife, with that husband. In Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 4. 
And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain, two, not three, not four, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, uh, they are, wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Therefore you see that when you are being uh, married, you will remain with that individual until death do you part. Until death. It is not that you marry this one now, kick that one out, marry another one, and kick that one out again. In First Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 39, the wife is bound by law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. As long as that my that woman is alive, you are bound by the law of God to that man, to that woman. In uh, Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 2. Romans 7 verse 2. For the woman which has an husband is bound by law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no more adulteress, though she be married to another man. Before you can marry another person after you have married, it means that you must, uh, the other fellow must have died. Without death, you are joined to that man, joined to that woman, if you are the first husband, if you are the first wife, you are joined to that individual until death do you part. And God hates divorce. He hates divorce between a man and a woman, somebody that is rightly married to another individual. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. Yet you say, wherefore, because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, your first wife, the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant, and did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one that might seek a godly seed, therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel said that he hated putting away, he hated divorce. For one covered violence with his garment, says the Lord of hosts, therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously it means then you will stay together but how do two people live together without having without separating and they live a happy life together now you realize as we're here we're living together for this short period and because we're living together here some things are inconveniences that we endure and bear with one another if you were to live in a house, in a home, with another person, and you are living like that for a long time, there might be conflicts. How do you resolve those conflicts? What are the principles God is giving to the people that want to have a happy marriage despite the possible conflicts and problems? In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 14. Above all, Above all these things, put on charity, love, which is the bond of perfectness. You will make up your mind that in the home, whatever happens, you will live in the love of Christ. Sacrificial love, a love that will suffer long, a love that will endure, a love that will appreciate the other person, and you will communicate in love. Communicate in love. You will not communicate in anger. You will not communicate with irritation. You will put on charity, love, which is the bond, the bandage, the belt of perfection, of perfectness. What will give you a blissful home, a happy home, a godly home, is not because there will be no problem at all, or misunderstanding once in a while, because you think differently, but you put on the belt, bandage, bond of love. And it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. You make sure that every day, only the peace of God will be the uh, referee. That is, everything you are doing, you look 
you imagine, you visualize that the referee is waiting there, his name is called Peace, and he says, when you do something or you say something which is not going to maintain the peace in the family, and the referee shouts, foul. And then you stop immediately. You don't continue kicking the ball. You don't continue uh, doing everything when the referee says foul. Then immediately you stop. Ah, uh -uh, something is wrong here. Our peace is being disturbed here. And immediately you rectify that thing. The love of God continues. And then peace continues. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body, be ye thankful. And then in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You see the word of Christ that says you pray without ceasing. If any problem comes, pray. That's the word of Christ. And then it says you forgive one another. 70 times 7 times if there is any offense forgive that's the word of Christ and they're all that he has told you in his word you let that word of Christ dwell in you richly that will help you in the family in verse 17 whatsoever you do in word or deed or do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks unto God and the Father by him if you see that verse of scripture let's be a little practical now Sometimes when you read the word of God, you just read it and pass over. But you see in that family, the way you are to lead the family life, whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Let's say something has happened in your family. And that thing that happened in your family didn't please you well. You didn't like it. The sister had said something that you didn't appreciate. And uh, you feel, what am I going to do to this uh, woman? You know, then something tells you, teach her a lesson. And then you raise up your hand. Remember what, uh, whatsoever you do, you do it in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to the Father, giving thanks unto God and the Father by Him. Therefore, you get near her, you raise up your hand, wham! You slap her in Jesus' name. Can you do that in Jesus' name? And then after slapping her, I slap you in Jesus' name. Then you go to the corner and say, Father, I thank you. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. You know what I'm telling you? Whatever you cannot do in Jesus' name, giving thanks unto, the, unto God and the Father by Christ, you will not do in the family. You will ask yourself before you do that thing, can I do this thing in Jesus' name? Can I give thanks unto the Father? If I do this, can I go back to the Father and I will say, Father, I thank you because of nothing I did. If, for example, your wife has done something you didn't appreciate and the children are all there, can you abuse your, father, your uh, wife and insult your wife and say, in Jesus' name, you are ugly. And then you go back to the room and say, oh Lord, I thank you for giving me that vocabulary. That I was able to insult uh, that woman. Whatever you cannot do in Jesus' name. And you cannot give thanks to God and the Father through Christ. Whatever you cannot give thanks for, that you cannot do. And uh, you cannot punish uh, the wife. Or maybe you cannot punish the husband. You can you, if you, the husband has done something you just don't appreciate. You say, today I will not cook for you in Jesus' name. You will be hungry today in Jesus' name. And then you go to the woman and say, Oh Lord, I was angry. I was irritated. And this man, I need to teach him a lesson. Well, because of this thing is doing. And therefore, I thank you because you have given me the boldness and the courage not to cook for this man today. When he gets hungry, he will know that you are a God of love. Now, whatever you cannot do in Jesus' name, and you cannot give thanks for, that you will not do in the marriage. If you know that principle, if you remember that principle, it will help you in your family. And then in verse 18, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. And husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Now, let me end up with number three. Point number three, price for building a blissful home. The price for building a blissful home. Already our time is gone. Therefore, let me just uh, give them to you the right things I want to share with you. Number one, prayer. You see, the family that prays together will stay together. And therefore, you need to understand, if you are really going to have a happy home, a godly home, a blissful home, there's a price to pay. Take every problem to the Lord in prayer, casting all your cares upon him, because he cared for you. Number two, pardon. Pardon one another. 
and have the ability to laugh over matters. Just say, uh, you know, something has happened and uh, you don't really like it. Have you seen those uh, students that are studying uh, theater arts? And uh, those students studying theater arts, uh, they, they are told if there is a particular act in the play that requires real laughter. And they tell them to really put it on. And those students, although there is nothing really making them to laugh, except that they are just practicing and, uh, you know, in the play, and they really put on a laughter, and their laughter will make you to laugh. Have you seen something like that before? Learn to laugh. Even when you don't feel like, just laugh. Until the wife will say, what are you laughing about? And then you begin to laugh again. What are you laughing about? And you just continue to laugh until your wife also begins to laugh because you are laughing. And then as both of you are laughing together, you just forget what you are talking about. Then after you have laughed together, you say, what was the problem before? I can't even remember now. I just remember that we are laughing. You see, when you learn how to laugh, you pardon one another, you overlook whatever has happened, and you go on in your family life. The Lord has given you that wife, keep that wife. The Lord has given you that husband, keep that husband. Number three, peace. Let there be peace. Just make up your mind. I am not going to sleep at night with irritation in my heart against my husband. Irritation, anger, bitterness in my heart against my wife. Every night before I sleep, I'm going to check up. I'm going to take an inventory. Are we at peace together? Are we in harmony together? Are we in love together? Or is she facing that way and I'm facing that way and I'm thinking, uh, I hope, uh, you know, this woman does not continue like this because if she continues like this, I don't know what I'm going to do. If you are like that, you're going to live a miserable life. Let there be peace in the family. Number four, patience. Patience. And, um, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about patience, it means you are going to be patient, number one, with people, number two, with things. You see, there are two areas of patience. You are patient with people, number one. Now, and, uh, the person we are talking about is your husband. He has a way he has been doing some things. And he has a way that uh, he lives his life. It's not that he's committing sin if he's a believer, but there are some things you don't really appreciate, and you want all those things to change. It requires patience. And then, patience with things. There are some things that may be happening, they are inconvenient. And even though they are inconvenient, you are patient with that thing. Number five, purity. Purity, very, very important. As a Christian, you ought to be pure. Even if you are not married, you ought to be pure. And now that you are married, make sure that you are faithful to your husband, you are faithful to your wife, you are pure. Number six, provision. Let there be no provision. Don't starve your family. Understand that there are necessities. Food, before clothing and necessities before luxury there are some things that are necessities in the family don't run for luxury when necessity has not been provided for let us be wise those of us who are married and understand the ne basic necessity for the wife basic necessity for the husband basic necessity for the children make sure those necessities are provided and then if you have the provision to go further let there be provision of the conveniences and now number seven perseverance persevere you have difficulty there you have a little problem there let there be perseverance and then number eight prudence that means wisdom the wise in your communication be wise who you allow to come into the family. Be wise what kind of maid you take into the family. Be wise what kind of influences you allow upon the children. Be wise how you allow the in-laws to come into the family. Let there be prudence. Prayer. Pardon. Peace. Patience. Purity. Provision. Perseverance. Prudence. And if we do that, I believe that the Lord will give us a kind of marriage that will be that will be symbolized by the marriage of Christ and the church. Always have that picture in your mind. You want your home to typify, to be symbolized by the marriage of Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it.
I pray that all the ears that have heard this message tonight, you'll never remain the same again in Jesus' name. For those who have not married, the Lord will choose for you. And um, I know that uh, time is gone. And I know that some of you are looking at your wristwatch and you are saying, when are we going to finish? I've finished now part one, which is preaching. I'm not only going to go to part two, which is prayer. You are going to pray and I'm going to pray. I'm not in a hurry tonight. How many of you are in a hurry? I'm not in a hurry tonight. We are going to pray. Every yoke of the devil we are going to break. Every hindrance coming from the pit of hell we are going to remove in Jesus' name. The Lord is going to give us a good family. Those of you are not, who are not married yet, I praise the Lord for you because we are going to pray and the Lord is going to make a definite change in your money, in your plan in Jesus' name. And those who are married already, whatever the problem may be, the Lord himself is going to bring blessing upon your family. Why don't you rise up? If you see that you are going to sleep, why don't you rise up and say, Lord, I really want your hand in my life. I want your hand in my life. If you are not married yet, consecrate yourself to the Lord. I will not marry an unbeliever. I will allow the Lord to choose for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Those who are not married yet, we are going to pray together. On condition, you accept the word of God, you will not marry an unbeliever. And that you are going to leave this choice of a wife, of a husband, totally, completely in the hands of the Almighty God. That you will trust the Lord, and that he will make the right choice for you. The best always comes from the Lord. If you are not married and you are making a covenant with the Lord not to marry an unbeliever and you are putting everything in the hands of the Lord that he will choose for you, I want you to raise up your hand. There is nothing to fear. Amen. The curse in the family of that individual that People don't normally get married. Ladies don't get married in that family. Tonight, I break that yoke in Jesus' name. The woman there, you have been married before and then you lost your husband. And now there's fear in your heart. And you're wondering if you got married again. The fear will always come back. Maybe the man will die again. I don't want to be the cause of men dying, men dying. That fear, spirit of fear, is sent away from your life in Jesus' name. The Lord is going to choose for us. Keep up your hand. And after this prayer, please believe the Lord. Though it tarries, it will definitely come. Father, in the name of Jesus, all these, your children, brothers and sisters, they are raising up their hands as a mark of surrender. Yieldedness unto you as a mark of meekness, surrendering under the yoke of Christ. O oh Lord, I pray, as the yoke of Christ is coming upon them, every other yoke in their lives will be broken in Jesus' name. O oh Lord, I pray for the people that recognize causes in their families and they come from polygamous homes oh lord i pray that curse will be removed from their head from their lives in jesus name oh lord i pray for the people that have the fear that if they got money this happened before maybe it will happen again that spirit of fear i command you come out in jesus name lord i am asking tonight all these my brothers and sisters raising up their hands and putting their lives into your very hand saying that you will choose for them saying that you will plan for them plan for them and choose for them in jesus name 